Okay, let's see. Yeah, this seems operational. Let's see live chat here. Stream elements bot is up. We got CDP Media says yay. And Pedro says first, but sorry, second, but it's close enough, you know. And Jason says, hey JC, hello. CDP Media says Twitter. Oh, he, he's trying to show you the Twitter, you know, because it's a tw good Twitter, you should follow it. Uh, at some point, he's going to probably say uh, beer, because he likes the beer. I don't know. So yeah, I'm just going to switch to this. And there we are. So, hey guys, you see here? Playing Call of Cthulhu RPG Solo Adventure Alone Against the Tide. Solitary Adventure by the Lakeshore. Hey, Leila is here. How are you? Stephen is here. Awesome. As you see, CDP Mia was starting to say it's beer, you know? That's good. I've set the stream to ultra low latency for good decision making because we are going to go against, you know, the mythos. Once again, we're playing the Call of Cthulhu RPG. You know, this is the Investigator Handbook, you know, which is a good book. This is the Keeper Rule Book, which is like the Dungeon Master uh, thing from Dungeons and Dragons. And we got some uh, Meleos Mostrorum, which we will eventually take a look at. It's just a lot of a compendium of monsters and stuff and stuff. But we're not going to play that. We're going to play a solo adventure, you know? Yes, we're going to play another happy little squirrel adventure trying to survive against monsters, you know? Chris Murphy is here. Hello. How are you, Chris? Welcome to the stream. And uh, Leila and CDP Mia are ex exchanging like cookies and, 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 and dreams and what? And a brain? That's kind of zombie, if you ask me. If you remember, we played this like a couple of months ago with like a, a professor as investigator. And in the end, we uncover a lot of the mystery, you know, and then we died because that's pretty much what you do in the Call of Cthulhu RPG. If anyone has, um, hey Greg, how are you? And uh, uh, if anyone has like, uh, you know, interest in knowing where this uh, or, or how this adventure was inspired, you know, I refer you to the complete fiction of Lovecraft. This is inspired by a tale titled The Doom That Came to Sarnat or Properly said, the doom that came to Sarnet. You, know? you want to read it? It's a short story. It's actually like 75, uh, 90. It's like 15 pages long, you know? This, this is the one that inspired this module in particular that we're going to play tonight. See, Premier says, yes, we use secret code. Yes. Jason says, having chicken fried rice with other venture, that is awesome, you know? It, it is good, it, it's an integral part of TTRPGs and all of this good stuff to play with, with like the food, you know? So, oh, and without further ado, I'm going to show you like what we have to play today. I'm gonna switch to this view. So, over there you see we got the chat, like on top, like right over there, there's the chat. So we get a recording of the happy little squirrel, you know, like uh, uh, decisions that we're going to make. CDP says Twitch. Yes, we're not on Twitch. You want to show the Twitch? The Twitch is good because in the Twitch we watch the Mystery Zombie Theater 3000 movies. You know? So it's a good thing. We have the Twitch, we have the Discord and we have the Twitter. That's all the things you can like type in chat and be happy. Okay, so over here we got the dice cam, you see? Or when you gotta roll them dice, and you see it right here. See, that's the dice cam. Over here, we get the picture of our investigator tonight. And this is her character sheet. This is Professor Eleanor Woods, which is, if you remember uh, the first time we played this module, which led to the death of, of our investigator. His name was Ellery Wood. 
which is basically the same professor, but in an alternate reality, uh, you know, where he was uh, like this dude, and now this is this lady, you know. But stats are the same, and I don't, I don't know if the story changes if you play male or female characters, but we will see, you know. So this is her, you meant Discord? Yes, yeah, Discord, Twitch, and Twitter. Those are the three things. Um, so this is her character sheet. Um, and, well, of course, this is the module. Alone against the tide, solitary adventure by the lecture. Let's take a look a little bit at the... Um, at the... Why is the Discord not working? Oh, there it is. There's the Discord. Um... Let's see what we have with Eleanor Woods. She's a professor, as you can see, uh, age 40. And she comes from uh, she, she comes from Boston, Massachusetts. And she currently resides in Arkham, Massachusetts. This is her picture. As you can see, she has like the fancy thing here and, and a hat, which is good, you know, because it prevents from when the monsters attack, you know, you have the hat. Um, and these are her stats, strength, constitution, size, dexterity, um, uh, what was app, um, appearance, education, intelligence, and power, you know? And Chris Murphy said, yeah, Boston, yeah, she's from Boston, you know? And um, remember Call of Cthulhu? Basically, what you need to remember is this is a system that uses percentages, you know? So numbers between 1 and 100. So, for instance, Eleanor Woods, she has 70 in intelligence. That means she has 70% chance of succeeding in a check against intelligence, you know? That's how this works. So you have to roll the dice. Normally, you, you roll this dice. You roll this one and this one. Or actually, this one and this one. You see, 74. Let, let me see, let me show you. That roll was 74. So we failed, you know? We need to roll 70 or less in order to succeed. Now we roll three. You see, let me just take away the dice cam. And in order to succeed, you need to uh, get the same amount or less as the number, for instance, 70. 35 is what we call a hard success because you need to roll under half of the... the oh, Jason did the... For another fun Saturday Night Adventure. Thank you, Jason. Thank you very much. It allows us to buy nerdy things and you, you, you're funding the next adventure, you know? Which, I don't know, there's a lot of these modules. We're going to keep playing them. So, thank you. Thank you very much. As you can see, 35, which is half her initial value, would be a hard success. And 14, which is one-fifth or her initial value, will be an extreme success. That is basically how this game works, you know? You have your percentages in different things, and if you roll under that, you succeed. You roll over that, you fail. And if you roll under half that, it's a hard success. If you roll under a fifth of that, it's an extreme success. And that's it. You know? Hey, Paul is here. Says, become part of the Discord. See my complete graphic novel collection of the boys. Wow. Nice. I actually also have the complete graphic collection of the boys, but not in, in paper, you know? I have it in digital. It was on the Humble Bundles a, a while ago. So yeah, uh, let me just check a little bit of the, um, the the character sheet. Her sanity is at 50. She, she is normal, as you can see. Magic points are 10. Luck, nothing, because we need to roll for that when we start the adventure. Hit points are 11. Some of the investigator skills, you see 45 in fighting. She, she's pretty good at fighting, apparently, you know, she can kick, kick your ass. We got 17 in archaeology and 16 anthropology, 16 credit, that's good, she has a lot of money, you know. Survival, 50. 
Well, and uh, locksmith 50, that is actually good. Psychology 50, language on English 80. Wow. Language other Arabic 40. Uh, her proficiencies, just in time for the sheet, yes. We're just taking a look at the, at the sheet, you know. She has 15 dodge. Backstory, personal description, a white woman with heavily tanned skin, dark hair and brown eyes. Wears a smart skirt suit with a lace colored blouse. Yes, I, I told you the, the lace thing, this is fancy, you know, we're fancy. You know? Yes, I'm explaining the, the sheet. Um, and a straw tam o' shanter hat, well, the, the fancy hat, I told you, you know, which looks at odds with her otherwise smart clothing, but it protects from the monsters. Ideology believes fortune favors the prepared mind. That is a good ideology, you know. It's a good ideology. Significant people, her old friends of the Boston Nine. Eleanor may have left her days of crime behind her when she got her education. But you never really leave a gang. Oh, she used to be in a gang. She, she, she's like a street kid, you know? Meaningful locations, Boston, the city she calls home. Treasured possessions, uh, the research manuscript she's been working on for over a year now. Eleanor hopes it will win her academic acclaim. Traits inquisitive and ambitious. That's pretty much it, you know? Yes, we have a rather powerful character. And she, she, she's young, you know? Uh, smart uh, skirt suit, lace collar blouse, straw tam o' shanter hat, thin brief a briefcase containing a research manuscript, change of undergarments, and a few essential toiletries, uh, the possessions, spending level 50, cash, uh, you know, it's uh, 300, and assets, 30,000, which for someone in the 1920s is pretty freaking cool. Okay, so this is our investigator for the evening. Professor Eleanor Woods, you know, you can see her right there. There's there's Eleanor Woods. Okay, so it's been a couple of months since we played this with the other investigator, and like I said, we died. So we, by the magic of the multiverse, are going back to. Uh, sorry, I was. I, I forgot. There you go. My, my awesome intro, intro was, you know, like, completely shattered by me not finding the right button on the Elgato. So, uh, in this multiverse of cosmic horror, we are going, once again, alone against the tide, in the Call of Cthulhu RPG. You see? This guy. This is Mighty Cthulhu. He may look cute, but, you know, he is cute. And also a great old one. Okay, so, let's get on with it. Okay, so, Alone Against the Tide, Solitary Adventure by the Lakeshore. This is one of the monsters, you see? So, uh, Alone Against the Tide is a solo adventure for the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. Unlike a standard game of Call of Cthulhu, the adventure requires no keeper, you know, the dungeon master as it is a solo scenario. In fact, you are both the keeper and the story main character. You can take on the role of investigator of your own design if you prefer one of the two ready-to-play investigators provided, Dr. Ellery Woods, page 80, or Dr. Eleanor Woods, page 78. They are referring to the character sheet, you know, the, the character sheet, read. and we're going to play as Dr. Eleanor Woods. Depending on the investigator you play, your reasons for traveling to the quiet, affluent lakeside shore in which the adventure is set may vary. The horrors your character experience and how much of the mystery affecting Esbury you manage to solve depends on your choices throughout the game. Hey, living life, how are you? We're just starting, you know, you just got here. We, we just checked the character sheet. This is our investigator, Dr. Eleanor Woods. We're good to go. For all its scenic beauty and charm, Esbury is a dangerous place, and there is every chance that your investigator could die as the, uh, as the events of Alone Against the Tide unfold, like it happened, you know, like a couple of months ago when we played this the first time. Thankfully, though, you can attempt this scenario as many times as you want to. 
You can also choose a different investigator or create a new one each time you play to help you explore the various challenges and pathways this story has to offer. So what are you waiting for? Esbir's fate is in your hands. Okay. So, we got the copies of the Call of Cthulhu Keeper in the starter set. Yes, we have not They're not necessary, yeah, but it's good. You intend to use Dr. Ellie Woods or Dr. Enor Woods, copy or print or the relevant uh, investigator sheet. We have them. This is the sheet. Yeah. And here we go. Getting started. Before you begin play, this, this is the, the, the investigator you was, you used last time. Remember? This was the jackass. Ellery Wood. He was a bit of a jackass. He died. Before you begin, you will need a set of role-playing dice. We have them role-playing dice, you see. A pencil and an eraser. Well, in that scenario, I have the clipboard, you know, and I'm going to be using the clipboard. I'm just going to move this a little bit back because, like I said, I'm going to be using the clipboard to write down the thing. Investigator poop face, yes, exactly. And he died because it serves him well. The digital copy definitely looks better, but I miss the thick paper. So do I, Steven, so do I. But you know, the digital copy has advantages, but you know, eventually we will use the thick paper again, eventually, don't worry. We will use it. Um, so the clipboard, yes. Here's the clipboard, you see? We're gonna use the clipboard in this. I'm gonna be writing down the, the choices in the clipboard in case I need to, I don't wanna die within the first 50 minutes of the stream, you know? The clipboard looks familiar? Yes, it looks familiar. Um, this adventure is designed to lead you through the basic rules of character creation. Yes, we don't need those because, yes, the, the clipboard is looking nice because we already have the character sheet um, if you prefer not to create your own character, male and female variants of the same ready-to-play character, Dr. E. Woods, is included at the end of the scenario. Yes, we have them. Okay, you have a pool of 70 bonus skill points to spend on any skills for Dr. Woods. This can include increasing those skills already allocated points or choosing other skills to broaden all Dr. Woods' abilities. Just set the bonus skill points divided up whatever you wish to the base skill values uh, written next to the different skills on the investigator sheet. Okay, so uh, as a guide, the following skills could be useful. Anthropology, appraise, archaeology, charm, climb, fast talk, fighting, firearms, intimidate, jump, listen, locksmith, navigate, persuade, psychology, spot hidden, stealth, survival, and swim. Okay, so allocate the 70 bonus skill points whenever you want to. Okay. Um, and then the lock points we're going to do later. So first, we're going to allocate the 70 points, you know. And I'm going to try to metagame as little as possible. So, um, what should we, like, try to allocate the points in, you know. For instance, I know we're going to have a lot of expenditure, so I'm going to allocate, we have 70 points, I'm going to write this down. I'm going to allocate 80 points here in credit rating, you know, so 80. So now we have 50 points. You know? What else do we need? Um, these guys, no, dodge. I'm going to increase a little bit of dodge. We're going to allocate 10 points here, so 60. So we got 40 left. Yes, we don't joke. Uh, uh, we don't uh, joke about this sheet. You know, it is a good sheet. Fast talk. Should we try a little bit faster? 50 point to laser eyes. Yes, that's. I think that would be a little OP. So for now, no. Fighting, 45. Psychology. Uh, let me see. What do we have here? Psychology, she has 50. So it's actually pretty good. Uh, I'm going to try... Let's see what else do we have. Persuade. This persuade is kind of low, if you ask me. Uh, jump. 
sleight of hand, spot hidden. Spot hidden is kind of low, you know. I'm going to allocate. I'm going to allocate. Um, we got 40 points left. I'm going to allocate 20 points additional to spot hidden. So it's 25 plus 20. So it go, to goes up to 45, you know. And we got 20 left. Some persuade. Yeah, we need some persuade. You know what? Screw it. I'm going to allocate the final here. The final 20, 60. And that's it. Points allocated. And as you can see, it all it is all written down here on the clipboard. That's what you use the clipboard for. Okay, the 70 points have been used. Let's just go back to the module. Okay, so reading this book. Yes, I know the bonus penalty dies. Um, pen the dice means that since this, this uh, system, you need to roll 100%. Uh, and you need to go lower than the value you have. Uh, a bonus die allow you to roll another tenth die and use the lower of the two results. And a penalty allows you to roll a second uh, tenth die and use the higher result. You know, you will see it during the, the the play combat. We know insanity. We're good. Um, let me see. Um, Lock points? No, we still not need to do the lock points. Reading the book for modern bonus combat. Using lock points, for example, if you kill. Okay, now we need to work out how many lock points our investigator has. You know, we need to roll a three d six. So let's go to dice camera, and a d six is this one. Is the classic. You know, die that you use in tabletop games so we need to write uh, to roll this three times you know so first time here we go big money people big money two that was not very big so i'm just gonna write down two for using the luck points remember the luck points is, a, is an optional rule that allows you to spend luck in order to change a result that uh, you know, you could fail or something like that. Five. That was a very good roll. And one more. Come on, people. Big money. Big money. <gasps> okay, could you blow on this? <gasps> Listen. Yes. Look at this. When Mighty Cthulhu blew on the die, it's six. Okay. So we got 13... And we need to multiply by by five. Yes. So uh, 13 is 15, 50, 65. So our luck is 65, which is actually a pretty, pretty good roll. So let's just hide the dice cam, go to the character sheet. And our lock points are 65, right there, you see? Yes, of course Cthulhu rolled the six for you in his, in his game, of course. Meowth uses Payday, it is super effective. That was a Pokemon reference for some reason. And Pirot says, classics are P best role-playing game. You're the one, JC. Thank you. Okay, let's just go with this. Okay, so, um, using the lock points, insanity, yeah, we have the insanity starting, and here we begin. Alone against the tide. Okay, people, crack your knuckles, do the thing, because we're going to fight some monsters. <clears throat> so, and here we got the picture of Dr. Ele Eleanor Woods, you know, which is our investigator for this evening. So, 
I'm gonna put like my my adult voice on. Okay, start. <clears throat> Our story begins sometimes in the 1920s, on the pier opposite the lakeside resort town of Asbury, Massachusetts. Your investigators' reasons for uh, visiting the town are discussed in the relevant entries. Read through the introduction and getting started sections and gather everything you need. Then, when you're ready to begin, go to number one. So now we go to number one. One. Huh? I'm going to use here in the, in the clipboard. I'm writing down this is lock points and story. So, number one. <clears throat> The sun sinks low on the horizon as you board the ferry headed across the lake to Asbury. As you set foot on the boat, the ferryman greets you with a wide smile and a cheery wave. He goes like this. He stands by the gangplank as you pass, welcoming the other passengers as he removes his cat to scratch at his balding head, like this. His pudgy figure fills his well-worn suit. He looks a little awkward, but he seems a rather pleasant sort. Leaving the man behind you, you take a seat towards the prowl, eyes fixed on your destination. Go to 12. And since this is a PDF, you know, you click. And now we're here. So, 12. You settle into a seat with your thin briefcase resting on your lap, noticing that the rest of the passengers are likewise getting comfortable for the short trip across the lake. Glancing around, you catch sight of a ferryman entering the cabin. As you sit patiently and wait for the engine to come to life, you listen to the sounds of idle chatter around you. You look out across the water and notice a thin fog beginning to form over the surface of the water as the temperature drops with the approach of night. And Pierrot says, hey mate, have you heard the Lovecraft audiobooks? Apparently mate. Yes, apparently. Uh, but I, I like the, the printed word more. But if you if you want to hit the hear the audiobooks, it's all good, you know. It's all with the books, you know. Hey Greg, we're just starting, you know, we're boarding the ferry. As bearded people that do so, smiling people have something to hide, yes. Everybody just, just smiling like this. Okay, and I need to move this a little bit there. So uh, yeah, that's good. Okay, so <clears throat> After a few minutes, you hear the engine sputter into action. It goes like this. That's the engine sputtering into action. And feel the ferry lurch forward. The conversation around you continues as the ferryman joins you all on deck. You can't help overhearing most of the talk, though it is surprisingly banal. You know? And I say banal. There are almost a dozen passengers on the ferry. Most of them are simply looking to spend their money during their weekend in Asbury and to enjoy the various shops and leisure activities the lakeside town has to offer. Many of the passengers seem to come from money, as it is common in Asbury. They come from money, you know, the big money. You notice a strange look from one of the women in the group. She has a full figure and brown hair and eyes. She seems to be looking you over, admiring your features. You know? She's kind of sassy. If you are creating your own investigator to do these things, no, we're not creating our own investigator. If you're using the pre-generated investigators, Dr. Wood, take a look at how their characteristics have been assigned. Yes, I did the thing. The half and fifth values have already been calculated. Yes, we already did all of this. Go to 80. 80. Pierre says, watching JC for a while, so I know you also uh, thanks to, to be here. Nice. Awesome. <clears throat> so, 80. The woman clearly sees something in you that she likes, you know? It must be the, 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 the bow, you know? The bow is fancy, you know? The, the bow over here, you can see it, is fancy. Also, the hat, pretty, pretty good, you know? Also, she has like the anime eyes. I don't have the, the thing that I use in the other like stream to go with the anime eyes, but she has the anime eyes, you know? Anime eyes are like pleasant. Perhaps it's your looks or a glint of intelligence in your eyes. It's the anime eyes. She gives you a sly wink. 
before turning to her companions. You likewise turn your attention to the rest of the passengers. Sitting apart from the general crowd are two men in dark, well-tailored suits. These were going to be henceforth known as the men in black. MIB, you know? Whispering quietly to each other. They have unamused expressions on their faces, as if they don't seem ple uh, pleased to be here. Perhaps they are on business. Noticing that you're sitting alone, the ferryman approaches you and stands over you with his characteristic smile. Like here. You see? Yes, exactly, Paul. She goes like this. You notice he's missing a, a tooth. He, he, the, the, the tooth. <clears throat> In the upper left corner of his mouth. Like over here. His eyes are bright as the light upon you. Good afternoon. You look a little bit lonely there, friend. What brings you to Esbury? Okay, no, we're not creating the investigation. If you're playing Dr. Woods, if you are a professor or use Dr. Woods, we go to 23. So 23. You mentioned the passing of a distant colleague in Esbury and how you've been sent by Miskatonic that is Miskatonic University Arkham, which is a recurring theme in, you know, Lovecraft uh, stories. Um, it's a university that supposedly has, uh, like, copies of occult books, uh, such as the Necronomicon. And it's a, it's a pretty shady place, you know. You've been sent by Miskatonic to recover his work and bring it back to the university. The man sighs and nods slowly. You mean Professor Harris? Real shame what happened to him. Always seemed like such a nice man. Officer Powell says they're still cleaning up the mess at the professor's place. You know, he, they walk around and they went like, because it was a mess. Some of the more valuable bits will probably be at the state sale tonight. If you're really wanted at it. The man looks down at his hands for a moment and then back at you as he extends uh, one your way. Anyway, I'm Lance. Lance Sanford, pleased to meet you, but I wish it were under better circumstances. Okay, so now we can inquire about Professor Harris, we can inquire about Officer Powell, we can ask Lance Sanford about himself, we can ask about the state sale, or we can just pass the time. So what should we do? Harris, Officer Powell, so Harris, Powell, Sanford, the estate sale, or pass the time? What what do you think we should do? You know? Should we inquire about Professor Harris? You type Harris. We type about Prof uh, Officer Powell. You type Powell. We talk about Lance. You talk, you talk Lance or Sanford. About the estate sale? Or just you pass the time? Jason wants to talk about Professor Harris. Stephen says about the sale, about the sale. Living life says about Harris. Okay, we got two Harris and two sales. And Pierrot says sounds like the shadow over in Udonwich. Yes, but I would like to know what would you like to do? Do we inquire about Professor Harris, Officer Powell, about Sanford, about the estate sale, or do we pass the time? Layla says Powell, because that was not uh, one of the options uh, people had voted. So now we have two, two, and one. Three, and Powell. Okay, so we got three Harrys, two sales, and one Powell. I'm just going to go ahead and ask about Harrys. So we go to 20, uh, 27. And CDP Mia says banana, which is always the default option. So, the ferryman raises a question in an eyebrow at you. Professor Harris, I can't say much really. I ain't know him all that well, but he seems like a, ni uh, uh, like a nice guy. I was sad to hear that he died. You gently press for more information about his death. Sanford frowns, but answers. Officer Powell says it's suicide. I'm inclined to believe him, but Professor Harris seemed happy enough to me more than content to relax in Esbury like anyone else. In between his studies, of course. Ancient Indian history, I think it was. 
I had coffee with the professor a few weeks ago, and he talked my ear off about it. I couldn't understand half of what he said, but he was quite excited by whatever it was. You exchange a few more pleasantries with Sanford before he goes off to finish uh, guiding the boat into port. You pass the time in casual conversation with the other passengers and in observing the scenery. You know the tall pines and the sloping hills along the lakeshore around Asbury. These features and the small town beyond are just visible through the growing mist, but squinting helps make them out uh, to your satisfaction. So there's mist rising, you see? Um, we need a tiebreaker, banana, no past the time, Harris, Powell too. Well, we asked about Harris, you know, and we knew that uh, they suspect it was suicide, uh, the passing of the professor, but he thinks th that's weird because the professor was happy talking about his studies, you know. In time, you arrive on the pier at Esbury, grateful to be off the water. And now we go to tree. Three. You take your first steps into the pier with the rest of the ferry passengers, trying to get your hand, uh, your land legs once again, because in the boat you went like this. You know? The passengers st still chat casually as they walk off to their destinations. You note one last flirty wink from the full-figured woman as she struts along. She goes like this. Yes, Kano said it three. Assisted suicide, also known as murder. You know? He 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 fell onto some bullets that were on her way, uh, going his way or something like that. And the, the the flirty woman, she went like this. Okay. Greg Holly says, "I have to go watch baseball with my mother and stepfather. Are you going to do this uh, again next uh, Saturday? No, next Saturday. Next Saturday we have a Transformers stream, but we will do this eventually again. And there's like." three sessions of this already on the playlist so you can watch those it's very very cool you know? so yeah we will play this eventually but like i said next saturday transformers stream so that's going to be awesome yes paul exactly she went like this um you notice one less a little flirty wing from the full figure woman as she struts along confi confidently behind the women accompanying her and you feel the two dark-suited men, the men in black, you know, uh, push past you at a brisk pace, nudging you out of their way. Like, why? What the hell? You know? Sanford gives you one last wave and a smile as he begins tending to the old rust-stained boat that is his pride and joy. The last light of the sun is fading fast, and the fog is growing thick on the water now. It's going thick, you know. The night is still young but you would rather not be wandering around in the dark and fog of a town you are unfamiliar with. Taking in your surroundings, you see a sizable crowd jockeying uh, for entrance into a lavish, modern-looking building along the lake's uh, side. A folding sign uh, sits out front, illuminated by a lantern. The words, Estate Sale Tonight, are written in large, bold letters. Well, this seemed to be the main uh, attraction, you could also seek out somewhere to stay for the night and set about your work in the morning. If you have not done so already, calculate your secondary attributes as per page 7, book 2 of the Call of Cthulhu starter set. We already did that. Okay, so, uh, thank you, Greg. So, yes, see you later. Yes, Paul, it was the thick. And Jason says, I'm interested in the story of the Winking Woman, as I understand if I remember that the Winking Woman, you know, she was the widow, you know, we, we might see her again. So what do we do? Do we go to the Estelle sale or we search for somewhere to stay for the night? What should we do? Do we go to the estate sale or we find somewhere to stay for the night? Stephen says sale. Yes state sale yes that would bring more you know like plot you know although remember that not metagaming we, but we know what happened at the sale this could have been a different uh, an opportunity to try a different path although i believe the path just circles around yes everybody says sale so we go to the sale you know do not be afraid to take you know like chances don't 
behaved like a happy little squirrel, you know? Yeah, she was the widow. Okay, we go to the sale, you know? 15. No happy squirrels, yes. 15. Pushing through the crowd, you make your way toward this, uh, the, the estate sale. Judging by the numbers of people uh, packing into the dance hall, this seems to be quite the event. Most of the people here are well-dressed, with conspicuous amounts of jewelry and designer clothing on display. You see a broad-shouldered man in a policeman's uniform standing by the door. He has a scarred yet clean-shaven face and a baton at his side. He has the stick, you know, and if he sees you doing nasty business, he just hits you and he says, charge my stick, and he hits you. Yes, no happy squirrels, just sad squirrel. Okay. Yes, because if we got happy squirrels, probably a monster is going to chomp on our asses and we're going to die. His brow is furrowed in a serious expression and he watches the commotion through narrow eyes. So he's like this. You see, I provide with the performance. You know? If you want to visualize what I'm reading, uh, you, you can look it over here and I, I will be providing the performance, you know? Unhappy Squirrel seems sad. Yes, exactly. As you mingle with the assorted academics and collectors, you notice a few other faces that stand out in the crowd. Most immediately, you spot a man in flowing orange robes with tawny skin. He seems more than a little out of place and garnering some odd looks from the other guests. Which is this guy, you see? Banyu. He's like a monk, you know? With the, with like the toga, you know? He has like like the, the happy expression, you see? This is the, 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 the monk. JC, do you have to refresh your stream? I do. What? I, I think what what? I don't think I have to refresh my stream. We're good. I'm not missing things. Maybe you need to refresh yours. So um Where was I? We're, you're good, you're good. Yeah, refresh yours, uh, period. Uh, oh yeah, we were describing this guy, Banyo. You know? uh, glancing around uh, further, you happen to notice the two dark-suited gentlemen from earlier, the MIB, you know, man in black, uh, standing in a corner toward the front of the room, talking to a young, dark-haired man in a dated yet elegant long coat. He is of a slight build and has rather sharp features. A thin wisp of a mustache hangs beneath his nose. You know, the mustache. Yes, the MIB, exactly. Um, most noticeable, though, is the rather attractive young woman standing on stage at the front of the room, next to a bespectacled, uh, bespectacled old man. Long black hair cascades down her shoulders, accentuating her pale features and complementing her formal black dress. Occasionally, she and the older gentleman peek at objects hidden beneath white sheets, the sale items waiting to be display, uh, displayed. Okay, so, uh, what, Dr Dracula? I don't think it's Dracula, you know. It's, a, it's the lady, or you were talking about the guy with the mustache. Who knows? We got a lot of choices, people. So, we could mingle with the crowd of guests. We could go to speak to the officer at the back of the room. You know? Hey, uh, Bardio. Welcome to the stream. We could go and talk to the guy in orange. You know? This dude over here with the happy face. We can uh, go talk to the MIB. We can go to, uh, towards the stage and the woman. And we can just leave, you know? The monk has built in evacuation with those ears. Well, he has, you know, like, he has big ears, you know? So what do we do? Do we mingle? Do we talk to the officer? Do we talk to the monk? Do we talk to the MIB? Do we go to the stage? Or do we leave? Leila says mingle. Living life says guy in orange. Stephen says mingle. Okay, we got two mingles. What do we do? Do we mingle? We talk to the officer? 
we talk to the monk, to the MIBs, we go to the stage and the woman, or do we leave? Okay, so we got mingle, mingle, mingle. We got three mingles, one stage, one, uh, two MIBs. So apparently we are going to mingle. Let's mingle. Yes, mingle with bananas, okay. We're gonna mingle, we go to 34. 34. This document looks like being out of a Lovecraft character. Well, this this is the Call of Cthulhu RPG, so stands to reason. Just a second. Sorry. <clears throat> so, 34. Rather than single anyone or anything in particular, uh, or, or, or anything in particular, uh, what? Out. You feel it would be best to use your time to get a general impression and speak to multiple people to get their points of views. Hearing the talk around the room, you come to understand that most of the people who have gathered here are merely treating this as a social event. In other words, they do not give a rat's ass. It's a social event for them. However, there is a fair number of academics and collectors in attendance as well. Judging by the relative wealth of the townsfolk, you imagine that there will be a, a lot of bids placed on the items. While walking among the guests, you happen to notice a pair of men conversing in hushed tones. They seem to be trying to avoid being overheard, but a keen ear might be able to catch what is being said. We're gonna make a listen roll, you know? So, according to our character sheet, our listen skill is... 20. Mm, that's going to be difficult. That's going to be difficult. So we need to roll a 20 or less. Let's go to the dice camera. Okay, people. We are going to roll. We need to roll a 20 or less. Big money. Big money. Let our ears be as big as the monks. Yes. Okay, Cthulhu, uh, blow on it. Okay. Well, that was not not a good uh, <laughs> roll. Sorry, Cthulhu. Fifty-four. You know. In other words, we could not hear <laughs> of what they were saying. You know. So we failed. We go. We go to forty-four. And I don't think I'm going to use luck points because we would have to use 10 luck points. And I, I don't think this was that interesting what, what they were talking about. So we failed. We go to 44. Too bad we're not the monk. Listen skill over 9,000. I agree. Okay, so let's get rid of the dice cam. So we're as, half dead as I am. Yeah. 44. You strain your ears trying to overhear the huddled pair's word, but the noise of the other conversations around the room drowns out what it is said. Go to 17. We go to 17. Okay, and apparently someone died here. I don't know. 17. Um, you have begun gathering information in Esbury. Would you like to interact some more? You may now select another option from those listed. Do not repeat the choice already selected. Once you have chosen three options from the list below, or before, if you are ready to move on, go to 35. Okay, so we need to uh, three options, and um, we already use one, you know? Note that selecting the leave the hole will make you ineligible to make further selections from this list. Okay, so we did one. Now we can do two more, you know, uh, selections from the same list as before. We already did the mingle, so that's not available. So what would you like to do? We could go talk to the officer. We could go talk to the monk. 
to the MIB, go to the stage or leave. Yes, yeah, weird, uh, Paul. Really weird. So what do we do? Officer, monk, MIB, go to the stage and the woman or leave. Jason says MIB. Steven says MIB. Living life says MIB. Yeah, because the last time we did not talk to the MIB. You know what? We're going to go and talk to the MIB. Okay. Let's go to the talk to the MIB. We go to 60. And we're using a second option to investigate. 60. You approach the huddle group and introduce yourself to them, stating that you recognize them from the ferry. The two men from earlier appear annoyed at your presence and are visibly irritated. Scram, man. We don't know you. You got nothing to do with us. You know? I mean, his voice was just mad, you know? It might be, but keep your eyes shut, yes because of the the third man seems likewise bothered and frowns at your intrusion he goes like this you know I'm acting they certainly make you feel unwelcome ignoring you in hopes that you leave the two men in suit turns their backs to you you see the jacket of each suit shift oddly as if it is ill fitting we're gonna make a spot hidden roll Okay. Spot hidden should be better because spot hidden. And Paul says anger J or K, maybe age, uh, agent J or K or M or O you know, or double L. By beep, I mean something beeped. Also, I beeped a long time ago, period. So you might want to refresh your stream. Okay, so spot hidden. So spot hidden, we got 45. So we got a 45% chance of succeeding. Let's do this. Come on. Big money. Oh yeah. Your your phone needs to know that you mean agents, you know? Well, we got an 85. So we we didn't see you know <laughs> so that's not good so we failed we go to 40. i guess we use all of our luck during the first roll of the dice for the lock thing 40. You take the hint and decide to leave them before they get truly angry. You turn back to the crowd and search for another distraction. Go to 17. Okay, we have one more. <laughs> we're deaf and blind, but at least we're good at talking. Something like that, Stephen, yes. We got one more chance, you know? So, what do we do? We talk to Officer Power. We talk to the monk. We go to the stage and talk to the woman, or do we leave? Oh, dice cam, sorry and sheet okay so what do we do talk to powell monk stage and the woman or leave stephen says woman pierre says officer leila says station stage i'm guessing that's it and monk okay we got one okay we got two officers and two women who is the man in orange? The man is orange, he's, a, he's like a monk, you know? So for now, we got two women, two officer, one monk. Okay, another woman. Okay, stage. We go to the stage. We go towards the stage and the woman. Go to 22. Stage banana, says uh, CDP Media. CDP Media, you might want to, like push live on your stream i think you are either you know like having a beer or way back on the stream okay 22 you made your way to the stage navigating around the many guests in the dance hall your eyes lock firmly on the woman and hers rise to meet you as she looks up from peeking at one of the, the hidden objects she stops what she's doing as you approach and a smile appears on her lips as she notices that she's caught your eye she goes like that she rests her left hand on her hip 
you know, like this. As you come to stand at the foot of the stage, the old man behind her continues his inspection, either unaware or uncaring that you come to distract them. The woman leads towards you over the edge of the stage. You can see her makeup has been painstakingly applied, despite her status as a recent widow. Seems okay? Okay. CDP media paid extra. I don't know, man. I don't know. Sassy. Yes, she's sassy, you know. You clear your throat as you meet her gaze and promptly introduce yourself. She extends her hands to you formally. Well, aren't you a new face in town? She teases. We get those quite a bit here. No doubt you plan to bid on some of my late husband's things. Good for you. Uh, good for both of us, I say. Just be sure to give a good prize for little old me, all right? And she winks slightly at you. She goes like this. You see? At three o'clock for you. Damn. Okay. So good, good night, Pierrot. Don't worry if you want to watch the rest of the story. It's going to be up on the channel as soon as YouTube is done processing. So have a good one, Pierrot. Maybe we could try the next Call of Cthulhu, do it like a, after launch on a Saturday, you know, for more people to, to join, you know, from, from Europe. So yeah, she goes like this. You realize now would be a good time to get some more information from this woman, who might be the most well-informed regarding your interests. She certainly seems like the flirty sort and would probably respond well to some more of the same. We want to make a charm roll, you know? So, let's go to the sheet. What is our charm status? 15! Okay, we we're not very charming, apparently. Okay, let's go to the dice cam. We need a 15. Wow! Incredible! One. This is the most extreme success possible. We rolled a one, you know, which in D&D is just bad. But in Call of Cthulhu with, uh, you know, like uh, uh, percentages uh, systems, this is the most extreme success, you know. So we're extremely charming, it seems, extremely charming. So that was just brutal, absolutely brutal. We charm, you know. We charmed the out of that woman. That was awesome. Okay, so I'm just gonna get rid of the dice cam and the character sheet. So we succeeded. We go to 43. That was awesome. You take her hand in yours and bring it to your lips, keeping eye contact with her as you do so. You see? We're being, which means smooth, and we're maintaining eye contact. Yeah. Like I said, we're deaf and blind, but we talk real pretty. Yeah. Character is a lot like me, except charm. I'm not that charming, lol, says Jason. Well, our character, Dr. Eleanor Woods, is charming, you know? He's charming. And Paul says, Jason, are you at least a prince? I don't know. He may, he may listen to music by Prince, but I don't think Jason is a Prince. So, we, we did the, the, the kiss in the hands, you know, while keeping, you know, profound eye contact. She giggles, and her smile grows wider as she regards you with interest. My, aren't you the charmer? If I weren't a widow, I'd be thrilled. But I still must mourn my husband, you understand. He was a stuffy old goat and obsessed with his studies. I have no problem selling his things, mind you, but that's because I need the money. A girl like me gets used to a certain standard of living, after all. But I can't very well go chasing after the fifth suitor who comes to replace him, no matter how fetching. She winks at you again and rests her hand on your arm and lowers her voice to a whisper. But perhaps you could join me for a drink later. I have a little bit set aside for good company. I won't tell if you don't. She seals the conversation with a final wink before lifting her hand and turning back to the stage and its hidden artifacts, 
we have been invited to take a drink later. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna write it down over here. Drink later. Nice. Go to 17. And we're done. We are done. So you're ready to move on? Go to 35. Okay, we go to 35 now. We already did. Oh, this one is not clicking. So we go to 35 like manually. A little weird? Yeah. Everybody's kind of weird. 35. The murmuring of the crowd dies down, and people begin to gather around the stage as Amelia and the older gentlemen call, uh, call everyone to attention. You know? The widow strides confidently to the front of the stage, where the lights are centered. But is she thick, says Canus. We, we don't know. She, she, she is a full-figured lady. That's the description, you know. I don't know if she you know, classifies it as a thick, you know. But she, she likes to wink. She's kind of flirty. She flashes a broad smile at the crowd, uh, at the crowd and begins to speak. She goes like this. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you all could make it tonight. As you all know, my husband recently passed and, uh, well, at this point, Emilia begins to tear up theatrically, you know, so much that her makeup begins to smear. She produces a handkerchief to dry her eyes before continuing. Well, I'm very upset. I miss my poor William very much, and I don't know what I'll do without him. And that's why I brought you all here tonight. I hope you can find some use for his collection, and I know that he would be happy to see his things go to those who value them highly. I hope you'll show this poor widow a kindness by finding something you like. But now let us begin. I'll leave the auctioning to Mr. Warren. Kano says, I'm thinking a shorter tall vampire lady. Yes, that is that is actually like a good mental image, you know? Think tall vampire lady, but like regular human size. Good point. Um, with her opening statement complete, Amelia moves to stage left and allows the big spectacle old man, presumably Mr. Warren, to take center stage. He clears his throat before speaking. <clears throat> Tonight we have six very ancient and very valuable items for sale from the estate of Professor William Harris. Though exceedingly strange, I have deemed these items to be authentic to the best of my ability. I have placed a ballot box slips of paper and a pencil on each of the six tables next to the item for sale. If you wish to bid on an item, simply write your name and the amount you are willing to pay for it on a slip, then place it on the box. The item will be sold to the highest bidder. All of the proceeds will go to the wife of the deceased. With that, Mr. Warren removes to reveal the gather items. Go to 70. So it's a blind auction. I think a blind auction is um, a Dutch option, right? Oh. 70. Mr. Warren approaches the first table and removes the cloth covering the reveal, an odd pair of clay cylinders covered with strange etchings. They are small and seem quite fragile, with lar cra large cracks running down their sides. So weird cylinders, you know, clay cylinders. Mr. Warren proceeds to the next table, and likewise uncovers the item in question. This one is significantly larger and more ornate. It appears to be some sort of altar or reliquary, heavily decorated with yellow-green gemstones. Yes, a shorter vampire lady would be a looker too. Yes, I indeed. However, there is one similarity with the first item, the presence of the same strange written characters, though these ones seem to have been painted on. The old scholar turns to the next item in question and displays it for all to see. A decorated crown of solid bronze, wrought with the image of a Hindu god. The next item is certainly the most mundane, a large, thick, leather-bound journal that appears well-worn and beaten, with several loose papers jammed between the pages. 
Mr. Warren senses the confusion of some members of the crowd and clarifies that the notebook is the assembled personal works and studies of Professor Harris. The item that follows the journal is a well-preserved ceremonial robe of a Brahim priest. The cloth is pure white. The last item is perhaps the strangest of all. It is a small statue or idol, presumably of one of the many deities of ancient India. Made from a blue-green stone in the shape of a rather grotesque lizard-like creature, the craftsmanship is crude and gaudy, so much that it appears fake. People begin moving among the items, looking them over and conversing quietly. Okay, we can make either an appraise or archaeology role. So, let's go to the character sheet. Appraise, we got 5%, so that's bullcrap. Archaeology, we got 70, so we're going to do an archaeology roll, because we got 70. We're good at this. We got a 70% chance of success. So here we go, people. Big money, big money. We need 70 or less. We got 54, so we succeeded. You know, just, just like that, we succeeded. So... Big money, yes. We go to 45. Yes, nice, you see? You examine the, the, the items with the trained eye, which is like maybe the left eye. You know, this is the one that's trained. Yes, successful, exactly. The crown and the ceremonial robe are obviously authentic and typical of what you would expect. They are in great condition and would certainly fetch a good price, you know? So the crown and the ceremonial robe. Though they are no rarer than any other antiquity. Likewise, Professor Harris's journal seems like it would be of value to a scholar, though a few delicate cursory pages turn show that it contains personal accounts and travel logs as well as historically relevant information. This is likely a good source of information on Professor Harris himself. So, the journal seems to be good, you know. The crown and the um, and the um, and the ceremonial robe, authentic, valuable, but you know, not particularly special. However, the other items are noticeably different. The altar and clay cylinders bear a similar script and both show comparable signs of aging and wear, so the altar and the cylinders appear to be, you know, like, weird. Given this, they are unlikely to be fabrications, but they are unlike more traditional finds from ancient India. A close inspection of the lizard idol leads you to believe it is likewise verifiably authentic. Though the workmanship is strange and unnatural, and clearly nothing like anything you've seen from ancient India or elsewhere, it doesn't bear any signs of work from modern tools or influence from modern styles either. So go to 81. We go to 81. You notice that you're not the only one looking over the items with such interest. The monk appears to be closely scrutinizing the stranger uh, items as well, and the dark-suited gentleman from earlier seemed to have taken a liking to the curious idol. Hey, Joe Farm, how are you? We're playing, uh, you know, Call of Cthulhu RPG. Yeah. Alone against the tide. We are an investigator, and we are at the auction of a deceased professor. And now we're going to see which items do we bid on. Apart from this, various other guests wander around the tables, occasionally fixing on one of them in particular. There are many guests and a fair number of bids being placed. If you would like to bid on the, any of the items, now is the time. You will be redirected to this entry after each choice, and you may choose to bid on any number of items. Please make each choice only once, and please note that each successful bid will lower your credit rating for future bids. You know? so, what do we do? Ikeno says, destroy the idol and the grand plan is foiled. Take Vampire Lady on vacation. Yeah, but we don't know that, remember. We could do that, but we don't know that. 
So, bid on the clay cylinders, on the altar, on the crown, on the journal, on the ceremonial robe, on the strange idol, or we don't do that. Clay cylinders and idol. Yes, I agree. We should go with the clay cylinders and the idol. And also I would bid, if you ask me, on the altar. That Those would be on, on, on and, and also on the journal. Journal, yes, let's start with the journal, okay? We're gonna bid on all of those, but we start with the journal. Because not to meta game, but we know eventually the other items, we just eventually we see them. You know? So let's start with the journal. We go to six. You feel that the information on the journal is essential to your interest and you cannot help but make a bid. You place your paper with the others and hope that Mr. Warwick calls you name when the amounts are compared. Made an appraise or credit rating roll, okay? Appraise or credit rating roll. We're gonna do the credit rating because we got an 80, you know, 80, which is just brutal, absolutely brutal. You see, over here, 80. So let's go to the dice can. First, we're going after the journal. So here we go, people, big money, big money. We need to roll 80 or less. Which is this one? We rolled a 94. We rolled a 94. And you know what? I'm not going to use luck points. We rolled a 94 and we rolled a 94. So this is a different adventure than the one we did before, you know? So we failed. 14. You place a modest bid on the bid of the journal, thinking its uh, unremarkable nature would prevent anyone from paying anything resembling a large sum. Clearly, you were mistaken, and another name is called, and a bright red and blonde haired youth goes to claim the book for a price that is noticeably more than you offer. Yes. We, we were like, wah, wah, wah. we suck. <coughs> yeah, sorry. But like I said, we, I, I don't want to play this exactly like we played the last time. So, you know, let's take chances. Let's be happy little squirrels sometimes. You know? So, yeah, we did not get the thing. Oh, sorry. Dice cam. Okay, so we go to 81 now. We had better luck, still died. Yes. Okay, so what do we, we, the journal is gone. What do we go? I recommend we go again uh, we, uh, after the clay or the uh, clay cinders, the altar or the, uh, the strange idol. I would go against, uh, you know, uh, and get, try to get the strange idol. What do you think? Strange idol? Clay cinders and altar. I think we should go after those three. Idol? Yes, I agree. Idol. 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 Yeah, let's go with the idol. 92. And like I said, we're not going to be using lock points in this stage. We're going to save them from, for later. Okay, the idol. Something draws you. Idol come Indiana Jones this crap. Yes, we're going to Indiana Jones this crap. Something draws you to the curious idol and you feel compelled to make a bid. You notice that you're not alone in this, as the monk and one of the dark-suited men both place bids on their own into the ape box. You hope that yours is high enough. Okay, we're gonna make a, a, again an, a, a, a credit rating. Okay, so sheet credit rating is still on 80 because we did not succeed the other one. So, let's go. Yeah, what could possibly go wrong? Dice cam. Big money. Come on, Cthulhu, blow on this. <sighs> okay. 38. So we succeeded. Hey, Pongo, how are you? We're playing Call of Cthulhu, you know? Um... Oh, here we go. Yes, we succeeded. So we go to 86. 
and we got the idol didn't say that extreme uh, uh, difficulty no it did not i think let me go back 92 oh crap you're right both with extreme difficulty whoa you're right good eye steven and like i said we're not going to you're not going to use dice roll so we failed again <laughs> crap no no it's good eye you know we we gotta keep it honest you know so quack if you fail go to 154. so let's go the thing and the thing we failed to get the idol though you put a sizable bid for the idol a truly outrageous sum is called easily twice what you offered you know mr warren squints hard at the paper before calling out the staggering price and an unfamiliar sounding name banyu which if you remember is like the monk you know but it's good this this fleshes out the story yeah the story yes denied yes sad squirrel Confused whispers break out as the orange robe monk collects the statue with a look of excitement on his face, you know? And if you want to know what that monk looks right now, you know, that monk looks... Let me just find it. I'm just going to quickly find it because I know he's somewhere around here. This is the look of the monk right now, you know? This picture was taken as soon as this guy got the things, you know? He is happy. So, let's be happy for him, you know? He's happy. Okay, 154. 154, 154. There you go. Go to 81. Hey, sometimes you make a you, you make a monk happy. You know, he looks happy, yes. This is probably a good thing, yes. Okay, so the the journal is gone. The idol is gone. Now we need to I'm going I'm gonna say we go for the cylinders and the altar, you know? The other things I don't give red says. So what do you say? Let's go to the cylinder. Uh, or uh, on the altar okay clay cylinders and altar yes we're gonna go with both you know so let's first go to the clay cylinders and then we go to the, the altar so let's go to the clay cylinders first which is 24. first clay cylinders 24 and uh, and then we're gonna go after the the altar so first the cylinders you write a, a, a reasonable bid for the pair of clear cylinders and place it in the box shortly after you do mr warren clears the box and begins checking the bids okay so we need to do a hard difficulty credit rating roll you know with this luck i would walk home and try not to die on the way yes it all it is also a good possibility to do that canis it's also a good possibility you know <laughs> gonna need to go to the next auction over for a pickup truck to haul it anyway yes most likely so we need to do a hard difficulty credit rating so in the character sheet our credit rating is 80 so hard difficulty is 40. You know, let's go to the dice cam. And remember, we're not using luck points in this section. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. We did it. We did it. Make a hard difficulty try not to die roll. Yeah, no, we did it, you know. Hard difficulty and everything. We did it. So we succeed, we go to thirty-eight. You muster your patience and wait for Mr. Warren to finish comparing the proposed bids for the strange clay cylinders. Thankfully, your patience pays off and soon you find them in your possession. We need to reduce our credit rating by 5 percentile, you know? So, it was 80, now it's going to be 75. 
There you go. And we're going to write over here in items clay cylinders. We got the clay cylinders, you see? Oh, sorry, I was uh, here. Clay cylinders in the character sheet, as you can see. And we reduce the credit rating to 75. Okay. So, um, go to 81. And now we're going to be on the altar, which is 103. You decide on a fair bid for the gemstone studded altar and submit your offer. Not long after, Mr. Warren empties the ballot box and begins shifting through the entries for the highest bid. We need a hard credit rating. Why is this so hard? Okay. So hard credit rating would be a 37. Let's go to the dice cam. Come on, people. Big money. Big money. Oh, crap. 46. We failed. Quack. Quack, 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 quack. And Ponga says, help, my tab died. What? Your tab died? R refresh, refresh. Okay, so we, we, we messed it up. Quack. Sad squirrel. We fail, we go to 59. No, suspense. Okay, so... Um, Mr. Warren takes his time mulling over the names and figures before calling out the name of a Dexter James, one of the dark suited men from earlier, comes forward to claim the altar. Interesting. The MIB, Dexter James. I'm going to write that down, you see? So over here, I'm going to write Dexter James equals MIB. Go to 81. Successful refresh roll, happy dance. Awesome. And the other two things are the ceremonial robe and the crown, but I don't think we are interested in those two. So should we, do we just continue? I, I, I say we continue, you know? What, what do you think? Should we continue? Or do you want to try and get the ceremonial robe and the crown? Personally, I don't give rats ass about those. My appraisal check, you know, continue. Yes, continue. Yeah, continue. Go to 16. 16. Your business here is completed. You see the crowd staring covetously at the newly acquired items. And you spot Amelia looking smug and satisfied with a leather bag full of cash. You know, she's probably going like this. Mr. Warren begins to clear away the tables while Officer Powell stands by the door and directs people out of the building and into the ever-thickening fog. Take a look at that. The fog is thickening. It's thick, you know? Though some seem content to stay and socialize, you feel that it would be best to go to bed, uh, to go back down for the night. So we go to 26. 26. While the estate uh, sale seems interesting, you would feel more secure with a roof over your head for the night. Well, this is not, you know, properly written because we went to the estate sale. You pull somewhat out of the crowd and inquire as to where you can find a room to rent. You are directed a few blocks into town to a modestly priced hotel a few buildings down from Esbury Police Station. As you enter in front of the cool uh, night air, uh, you are greeted with the heat of a roaring fire. The small front room feels stuffy and cramped. The bulk of the space is dominated by the large service counter, behind which sits a wiry-looking wisp of a woman. She turns her eyes uh, to you and asks your name, then quotes you at a price that's more than fair. With the transaction complete, you haul your thin briefcase up the stairs, unpack it, settle into your room for the night. 
Yes, Steven, the widow said that she she would like to have a drink with us, you know, but apparently, you know, she was like, go, go get a drink. We're not getting the option. Go to nine. You wake in the morning, grateful for the rest. You rise from your bed and take in the modest surrounding that make up your room. The furnishings are spare, uh, sparse. A small, poor quality dresser and a cramped and dusty wiring desk, uh, writing desk, uh, tuck in the corner. Sitting atop the desk is a plate of eggs and toast. Mm, delicious, delicious egg and toast. Apparently set out for you by the hotel's owner. The walls are plain and unadorned save for a single window that faces towards the lake. However, this view is currently blocked by the incredibly thick fog, which is thick, you know, which has taken on a pale green hue. Yeah, because green fog, you know, green thick fog coming from the lake is completely normal. <sighs> Your vision is obscured entirely and you cannot see into the depths of that outlandish green mist. You also notice your personal belongings placed among the room exactly as you left them the night before. Go to 106. After getting dressed and eating the modest breakfast set out for you, you're ready to begin your day. You take a moment to consider what that means for you. It's thick, yes. Your mind turns to Professor Harris. If you're so inclined, you might be able to investigate the circumstances of his death further. Considering that you don't have uh, his widow's Amelia address, you will have to start your search with the official reports filed with Officer Powell at the police station. You don't like the look of that fog? We don't like the look of that fog either here. Alternatively, you could take this free time to look through your belongings and examine any items you might have. The hotel owner has been in your room, so a check of your things might be in order. Or perhaps you have some other reason to look over your possessions. Finally, if you feel your business in Esbury is concluded, you could always try to find Lance Sanford at the ferry. So, what do we do? Do we go to the police station? Do we look at the items? Which we have only one item, actually. Or do we try to get the, you know, like get that out of town and go to the ferry? What do we do? Police station, items, or ferry? Remember, this This is an opportunity to try something different. Stephen says, look at items. Leila says, look at the items. Which is the exact same thing we did the last time. Police station, says Jason. Personally, I would have tried to get the hell out of town, you know, just to see if it's possible. Items, items, items. Okay, we got three items. Let's just go over to the items. 32. 32. Cursory inspection of your personal belongings reveals that nothing is amiss. All of your possessions are just as you left them. Stephen says, I wasn't here for the last stream. Sorry if I'm picking the same things you guys did the last time. Well, we tried to be like uh, smart and investigative the last time, you know? So <coughs> that's why we did the thing. But it's okay, you know, you just choose. I'm just giving you options. Um, while you're here looking things over, you can take this opportunity to more closely scrutinize items bought at the estate sale. Alternatively, you may leave and go explore elsewhere if your curiosity is satisfied. After examining each item, you will be directed to this entry of giving the option to proceed as appropriate. If you have none of the items or are done looking over what you bought, choose to investigate elsewhere. Jason says, Stephen, I can't remember most of the last choices. Long. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to examine the clay cylinders, which is the only thing we got, you know, 62. These are the clay cylinders, as you can see here in this picture. You know, they have strange markings, a little bit of cracked. These are the strange cylinders. Brick cylinders of Kadatheron. That's that what it says here. You turn the hardened clay cylinders over in your hands, your eyes falling on the large cracks running through both items. Despite this damage, their solid constructions has led to the cylinder survival through the ages. 
The next most obvious quality uh, is the strange writing plastered along the sides of each cylinder. It's quite remarkable in that it doesn't resemble any language known to you. Unfortunately, you have no way of translating it. Yeah, these are the cylinders, you know. They're like, uh, you know, cassettes. Like thousands of years old, but cassettes. I don't know. Go to 32. For the next one of these, I need uh, like a glass of water because my throat is getting kind of raspy. <clears throat> okay, we, we, we don't have any other items. So, what do we do? Uh, we could go to the police station or to the ferry. What, what do you want to do? Police station, which could lead to information as to where the widow lives. Or we could go to the ferry and try to get the out of town. What should we do? If you want to investigate, let's, let's go investigate. Try the ferry. Yeah, I'm, I'm a, I, I, w I would like to try the ferry because the last time we went to investigate. And if you if you want to watch what happened the last time, it's in the playlist, you know? In the main page of the channel, you go down to the in real life page, like uh, unboxings and role play and stuff. And there it is, Call of Cthulhu along against the tide. And we went to the police station to investigate. Nobody uses cylinder drives in 2021, says Punk. Hashtag Punk. And Paul says, Cracks like the caverns of the who, of the He Who Remains, but back together with the souls of a million timelines. Yes. Going to the police station to get the widow address seems kind of creepy to me. Let's get out of town. Yeah. Go to the ferry. One, eight, 153. You pause to consider the strange green coloration of the fog. And it's incredible thickness, you know, it's thick. You wonder if it is even safe to be on the water with visibility so limited. You decide to head for the docks first to see if the ferry is still running before hauling of your, all of your possessions down to the lake shore. You venture out into the glowing green mist and walk briskly towards the docks. It's thick, yes. You arrive to fight Sanford pacing the deck of his boat with a small flask in his hand. He stares out into the fog, lost in thought, before you rouse him by inquiring about passage out of town. He confirms your fears. Sorry, I can't take her out like this. Can barely see three feet in front of me. The lake is fairly tame, but I have no way of telling where the shore is or there any other boats might be on the water. I like you, but it's too dangerous. Just can't risk it. I've rarely seen a fog this thick, you know, and this green, you know, because fog is not supposed to be green. Is this what they call a pea soup fog? Maybe, but green, you know? Which I don't think fog is supposed to be green. Um, never seen anything like this. I'm staying put. You know that nothing you say could possibly convince him. Resign to your fate, you head back towards the rest of the town. Okay, so what do we do? We can go to the police station, try to learn more about the case of the professor and then maybe the address of the widow to go visit her, or we can return to the hotel. What do we do? Police station or hotel? You choose. Yes, Stephen. This is the fog of doom. We got one police station, two hotels. When you play this game, my mind still remember your Cthulhu playthrough. Yes. The Sinking City and also Call of Cthulhu Dark Corners of the Earth. Okay, we got several hotels. We go back to the hotel. 122. And you know, this opens new, like, narrative branches. So I, I like that we're trying things, new things. Feeling that is the best course of action right now, you return to your room at the hotel. You turn the key in the lock and your door swings open to reveal a startling scene. Like, you go like this. <gasps> your room has been ransacked. The bed is overturned and the covers are strewn about. 
the dresser drawers have all been pulled out and emptied. Your briefcase lies open on the floor. Anything of value you had is gone. Anything you may have gained from the estate sale is no longer in your possession. And anything you brought with you beyond the basic essentials is likewise missing. People, we got robbed, you know? We have been bamboozled, run amok, robbed, you know? The window hangs open, letting the greenish mist into the room. You close it to keep out the chill and begin to set things straight while you overcome the shock of what has happened. Yes, help, police, I have been robbed. There's been like a thief, you know, thief. As you consider your options, the sound of a loud and violent commotion drift in from the room next door. So, just so we set the stage, we are in our room back in the hotel. There is some weird, weird ass thick green fog outside. We have been robbed, you know. Anything we got, which basically were like the, the cylinders, they're gone, you know. And then you hear commotion coming from the room next door. What do we do? Do we ignore the commotion or do we go and investigate? You choose. Stephen says, ain't none of my business, man. Ignore the scuffle. Jason says, crap. Well, we could crap all over the floor, but it's not an option. Or maybe we're just crapping all over the floor and we could still consider. What do we do? Do we go to see the commotion or do we ignore it? What do we do? Ignore or investigate? Jason says investigate. We got one investigate and we got one ignore. Jason says law. What do we do, people? Greg Appleby says investigate. We got two investigates and one ignore. I'm just gonna keep writing here. Ignore, investigate. We got another, three investigates. And Paul says IB, which I believe is investigate. And Paul says now IV, which will most likely investigate. And Paul, in this moment, this moment is just throwing his new iPhone out of the window because you know he he's had it with that thing. He just had it. Okay, we're going to investigate. You know, this is probably going to result. Oh, now now he said investigate. Awesome. Probably going to result in our in our death, but we're going to try it. One forty-two. Fearing that someone might be in danger, or perhaps uh, that this commotion is somewhere related to the death. Uh, from your room, you rush to investigate. You find the adjacent room door open, and inside you discover a large and familiar looking man in a dark suit. Oh, the MIB might be Dexter James. He looms over the prone body of a beaten and blooded Buddhist monk. This guy went and he's kicking the, 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 the monk's ass. That, 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 that's bad, you know, he's kicking, the, the Buddhist monk, he was so happy, you know, he was like this, with the, with the ears as well. And now this guy is just wailing on this guy, that, that, they ain't gonna fly. The man in the suit has clearly worked him over. The suited man has his back to you, and you doubt you're being noticed yet. With a little luck, you might be able to get the drop on him and subdue him quickly. Alternatively, if you have come up possession of a firearm during your stay in Asbury, you could always resort to little force. Yes, we're angry squirrels now. Oh, eventually you could come into possession of a firearm. Interesting. Time to fight with extreme prejudice. Okay. We're going to subdue the men, making a fighting brawl roll with a bonus die for surprise. Yes, so it's, it's not cool to beat up a monk, you know? If you succeed, go to 97. If you fail, take the damage. If you survive, if you reduce it to zero hit points, you die. Okay, so we're going to do a fighting brawl roll with bonus die because we are surprising. So what does that mean? You know, well, let's go to the, the sheet. You know? This is going to happen in the sheet. Okay, so we, are f we got the, the fighting brawl. We put some points, you know, we got a 45 
and we have advantage, you know? Uh, so we're gonna roll a bonus die and we take the lower in the tens. So let's just go to dice cam. You see, this is the tens die. We're gonna add this other tens die, which represents our advantage. So we're rolling these three dice. Okay, Cthulhu, blow on it. You wanna punch them, yes. So you see, we discard the higher one, which is this one. And we get a six, you know? Which is like, if you, if you, if you take a look at our brawling, a six is an extreme success. So we just basically, you know, we just kick the out of this guy, you know? So we succeed, we go to 97. Huh? 97. We entered, you know, we grabbed the chair and we yelled, you is a punk ass. And we just, you know, like wailed on him and he just went down, you know? 97. You rush the man and swing for his head. Your blow lands and carries him into the wall, you know? Chisel to the forehead. Yeah, he went like that. Yeah, punch his squirrel. Exactly, Leila. We kicked him in the family jewels, we, we just wailed on him, you know? He went flying into the wall. Just, just uh, With a sickening crack, he's rendered unconscious and collapses in a heap on the floor. And then we spit on him. We like, you know? The punk ass. Yeah, we walked in the room WWE style. You stand over the wide-eyed monk, you know? And he seems to be so happy, you know? He comes to Jason with a steel chair and a pop. He seems battered and bruised, and in no doubt in some degree of pain, you know? Still, he manages to rise to his feet and extends his hand in gratitude. Leila says, yuck. <laughs> he offers words of gratitude to you for rescuing him from his stacker. I am glad that you came when you did. That one was rather violent. It is regrettable that you had to hurt him, uh, hurt him so, but he will live. Well, we could, you know, like kick his ass again, so we doesn't live. Yeah, can't win much, but we can win a fight. Yes, we kick some ass. You know, this lady over here, you know, she just punched the crap out of this guy. Oh, the character sheet is still up. There we go. Good, good. So yeah, the lady here, she just well on this guy. You know. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um. You inquire about the reason for the brawl, and the monk replies slowly. His friend robbed me of some of the relics of my temple. This one wished to stay behind and inflict harm on me so that it would not pursue them. Yeah. Hit him with the chair and he gets up. Next time, use the table. Yes. Yeah. Kick his ass. Yes, I like her as well, Pongo. She's sassy. This one wished to stay behind and inflict harm on me so that I would not pursue them. You mentioned the robbery in your room and express common cause with him. The monk smiles at you and shakes your hand more vigorously. Then we shall go after our things together. I uh, heard them discuss where they would meet up later. After that one, he points to the unconscious thought and you like spit on him. Like, yeah? You know, and then you kick it a little bit. Uh, was done with me. Wondering at your good fortune and not willing to turn down any aid, you accept the monk's help. So, you know, the monk has joined the party. You know, now we have a monk helping us. And even though he got his ass whooped, he could still like get like a steel chair and just wail on people, you know. You doubt the suited men will be waking up anytime soon and you both go, uh, be gone by then. You simply leave him and exit the hotel with the orange robe Buddhist leading you through the mist. Okay, so the monk has joined the party. Now we go to 13. You see, this is a completely story from the original that we played last time. 
And this is the guy. This is how happy he was after getting the stuff, you know? Now imagine with a little bit bruises, maybe a cut on the on the on the on the you know like the the ear, you know, stuff like that. Yes, everybody needs a monk psychic, Canus. I agree. So 13. Banyu, the Buddhist monk, you know, I'm gonna write it down over here. He's, he's, this is his name. Uh, this is Banyu. This is the monk. Chats casually with you as you walk through the fog, you know. God is on our side now. Well, a God anyway, yes, you know. Actually, I think Buddhism um, is supposed to be like, um, uh, you know, with uh, atheist at its core, you know, something like that. I, I, I heard the Dalai Lama saying something like that, but just, just some, uh, you know, like uh, random fact that came to my mind. But yeah, we got, we got, we got like the body monk, you know? And Paul says, honestly, I really want to give him a hug. Yeah, he was completely, you know, like beat up, maybe one ear a little bit broken, you know, because he had big, big ears, you know? And he was so happy, you know? Maybe, maybe now he's missing a tooth, you know? He has a black eye, you know? Poor monk, you know? Okay. So... You both note that the light is beginning to dim through the mist, and this becomes the topic of conversation for a few minutes. It will be even harder to see soon. I would not like to be out and about any longer than we must. This fog is most unusual. Is this hue common here? Uh, no, Banyu, I don't think there's green fog anywhere on the world, you know? You respond that the greenish color of the fog is highly unusual. And he seems mildly perturbed. I have seen nothing like this at my temple in India either. The conversation continues like this for some time, until finally you arrive at your destination. The place in question is a small house uh, located uh, on the edge of town, near the church. Jason says, that's cool, I'm atheist. I believe in people, which is a challenge uh, right now. Yes. The conversation continues this for some time uh, until finally you arrive at your destination. The place in question is a small house located on the edge of the town near the church. Uh, Banyu informs you that he has no intention of going inside, as he knows it may result in violence, and he is opposed to physical conflict. He shows you a quick glance and then goes to stand by the church. You try the door and find it unlocked. You have no doubt that the man inside will be armed. So you sleep in quietly, hoping to avoid notice. Okay, so Banyo stayed behind, you know, outside the church. We entered, you know. And over here it says, make a stealth roll. If you succeed, go to 165. If you fail, go to 144. Note down, meet Banyo, entry 215 on your investigator sheet. Later, you may be prompted to visit Banyo if you know where to meet him. At that time, you may go to 215. Okay, so 215. So I'm gonna just put the character sheet and I'm going to write down over here a note. No. Meet, me eat, ban you, 215. You see, we got the information and I'm going to write it down over here as well in the clipboard. Okay, so 2.15. Uh, when we are prompted to visit Banyu later. For now, we're going to make a stealth roll. It's a regular stealth roll. So, what do we have in terms of stealth? Oh, crap. We should have point, put some points into stealth. It's a 20. But if you remember, I said we were saving our lock points. So maybe we start using the lock points now. Okay, let's go to the dice cam. We need to beat a 20. 
and we're gonna use luck points if we need some. Uh, this is oh crap. Well, that one was a ninety-seven, so we're not going to use the lock points. <laughs> yeah, it was a ninety-seven, so <laughs> we can't use the lock points. Uh, we failed. Go to one forty-four. We're going to notice our asses. One forty-four. We still suck, yes. You open the door, I'm going to get rid of this and get rid of that. So, yeah, no ninja. You open the door, but it catches a draft, slamming against the wall as you attempt to slip inside. Okay, so you try to open the door and it was bomb. The door rattles on these hinges and you hear the sound of footsteps pounding across the floor in another room. Yeah, these guys are kind of, they're not working this time. Your attempts to conceal yourself prove too slow as a pair of men burst into the living room and lock uh, their attention on you. They rush forward and the larger of the two tries to tackle you. Make a dodge roll. If you succeed, okay, let's do a dodge roll. So what do we have for dodge? 60. Not bad. Look at this. Dodge is 60. We're gonna try this one. Fourteen. It was the fourteen. We succeeded. Okay, so we succeed. We go to one fifty-seven. We knew it. We went like one fifty-seven. You duck the blow and dodge out of the man's way as he flings himself towards you. He stumbles into the wall. You quickly throw your weight against the assailant and knock the wind out of him. This lady, you know, he kicks ass, you know? She, she knows how to handle herself in a fight. Yeah? As you've stunned the large man, you take the chance to enter the building, slamming the door behind you and blocking him from attacking you again once he recovers. Unfortunately, you are now face to face with the other man, who scowls menacingly at you while brandishing a knife. You know, he goes like this. You bastard. Think you can cause trouble for old Josh, eh? I'll gut you like a fish. You know, I'm gonna gut you. I'm gonna gut you. Besides, I think we could use a little bit of blood for what's coming next. He shouts something incomprehensible and lunges at you with the blade. His eyes betray his murderous intention. We need to make it another dodge roll, you know? So, character cheat. Dodge was 60, dice cam, another dodge roll, and we have lock points. We're going to do this. Look at this, 63, we're going to be using three lock points. So, we're going to use three lock points, so we go to 62. No, 62. And we succeed. You know, we went ninja. Yes. This character is like me. Can hear or see well, but can fight, says Jason. Awesome. So we succeeded. We go to 121. You wait for Joshua to strike. Timing your reaction just right. The lady was like this. He drives forward with the point of the blade and you roll to one side. The force of his launch carries his blow through, and he embeds the knife in the wall behind you, cursing as he does so, because he a jackass, you know? He lets go of the blade handle and turns to face you, balling up his fists and adopting a rated stance, you know? He takes a few experimental swings at you, which you handily dodge, because this lady, she's hardcore, you know this lady? She's hardcore. Still, you cannot simply keep avoiding him. You have to subdue him if you want to make it out of here. And judging by the banging on the front door, you have to do it quickly. You know? A little bit of meta gaming. This is the house 
of the professor. You remember from the last time we played? There was the house of the professor, and there was like the, or maybe it's not the house of the professor because it's close to the church. I don't know, it's a house, you know? For a second, I thought it was the house of the professor, but it could have been in a different house. It's okay. We need to make a fighting brawl roll, you know? Let's get dangerous, yes. So, fighting brawl uh, roll. Okay, so. Um, brawl, fighting brawl. We need to beat a 45. Forty-seven. We're gonna use two luck points, so we're gonna now X. Let's just get this. We're now at a sixty, and we succeed again. We've been saving the the luck points. Charlize Theron needs to play this character. Yeah, she kicks ass. Okay, so we succeeded. We go to ninety-three. There's some sort of demon ass over here. I don't know what the hell. 93. As before, you sense Joshua's frustration and realize that patience is the better course of action. You wait for him to swing. He throws his full weight behind the blow and you easily move aside and shove him forward, using his momentum against him. Nice. Ninja moves with this lady, you know? You send him crashing into the wall. He drops to the floor, thoroughly da dazzled, dazed by the force of the impact. You hurry to the front door and barricade it with a chair, buying you time to move about the house freely. Glancing about, you see a small living room and kitchen, and two doors at the opposite ends of the common area. The door on your left is wide open, and you can see a set of stairs leading down. The door on your right is closed. You assume it leads to the bedroom. Badonkadonk monster ass. Yes, exactly. JC Lee, yeah. The, the, it's actually Eleanor Lee, you know? She, she went like... Okay, so... A little bit of metagaming parenthesis. I think this is the door, this is the house where last time we died in the, you know, downstairs, but because we made poor rolls. So we could try to investigate because Probably the other things that these guys like stole, they're probably downstairs, you know? Or we could head into the bedroom. What do you think we should do? Do we go downstairs or we head into the bedroom? What, what, what should we do? Like I said, I think we can go downstairs, you know? Stephen says bedroom might find something useful. That is actually a good point. Layla says downstairs. Good things always happen in the bedrooms at Friendly Balls. Okay, we got three bedrooms, two downstairs. Bedroom, downstairs. Let's see one more. Darwin Dog says bedroom. Bedroom. Okay. Yeah, I agree. You know, let's go to the bedroom. Okay, let's go to the bedroom. 202. Also, uh, welcome to the stream, Darkwing Duck. Big fan here, you know, big fan. Can we hit this guy with a poker before exploring? I would have done that and then spit it, you know, like... 202. You open the door to find a bedroom, much as you expected. The room clearly belongs to a bachelor, as the only feminine object is a set of lace sleepwear lying across the bed. Oh, someone is going cheeky bow bow in this thing. You look to a nearby nightstand and find several framed photographs of Joshua and Amelia, so you assume the clothes are hers. Peeking out of a drawer in the nightstand is an open box of bullets, as well as several bottles of bootleg whiskey. Hmm. A reboot of... I think it's a series... I don't know if it's a movie, Paul. I think it's a series. But okay. So there's bullets and uh, bottles of bootleg whiskey. And there's like some, uh, you know, lace sleepwear lying across the bed, you know. 
You scan the rest of the room. The only other object of note is a dresser. You search it and find it to be full of men's clothing, the sort of Joshua would wear. However, as you are riffing through these things, you find an envelope. Turning it over, you see it's unsealed, and judging by the crumpled state of it, the letter inside has been read over several times. Yeah, there might be a, a gun somewhere, we're gonna find that. You pull out the letter and begin reading. It appears to be a correspondence between Joshua and a Dr. Weber, based out of Arkham. Weber is, apparently, a psychotherapist that Joshua sees on a monthly basis. According to the letter, the past few months have been quite difficult for Joshua. In addition to his criminal activities and his relationship with Amelia, he has been troubled by strange dreams, which Dr. Weber labeled as obsessive delusions. Joshua has a fixation with a particular dream of a beautiful city in a far-off land. He describes the city as made of marble and says that sometimes he wakes up crying because he has to leave it behind in his dreams. He also reports seeing a frightening lizard thing in the water of the shore of this strange city. Sometimes, in the night, it whispers that it knows the way to the city. So the, though the lizard thing scares him, he listens to the whispers. Joshua professes a deep desire to go on to the city, though he doesn't know where it is or even if it is real. For his part, Dr. Weber assures Joshua that these things are completely fictitious and that he must find a way to return to reality and leave the delusions behind. You return the letter to its envelope, then slip everything back where you found it, thinking about how this affects the course of events hit in Esbury. Silently, you return to the main area of the house. You may now investigate the basement or leave the house. Yeah, it's a series. Okay, so just a second. A little bit of story, you know. We just found that this guy Joshua has criminal activities, mostly, uh, you know, liquor bootlegging during the Prohibition 1920s. And he had an affair with Emilia, you know, the professor's uh, widow now, you know. And he sees images of a city, you know. Remember that because when the, when the, uh, the story is done, you know, I will tell you about the, the story of the city here from the, the, the Lovecraft thing, you know. But now we know Joshua was having an affair with Emilia. And if you remember a little bit of metagaming the last time we played this, we found out that uh, Joshua actually killed the professor and then made it look like a suicide because they wanted to run away with Emilia and live together, you know. But something happened with one of the things the professor had that is just messing with his mind, you know? And then I'm going to take you, uh, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you the story of that. So, Joshua likes big butt and he cannot lie? What? He likes the demon with the big butt. Okay. So what do we do? Do we investigate the basement or do we leave? Those are the choices. But it's interesting, you know, we, 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 we reached the same area as the last time, but with a completely different route. What do we do? Do we go to the basement or do we leave the house? Leila says basement. Anybody else? Do we go to the basement or do we leave? Paul says basement, living life says basement. Jason said he wanted to leave, but... Yeah. And just like the widow's with big butt. She, she has a full figure, we don't know about the big butt. Although, if she looks like a tall vampire lady... We got one more basement and one leave. Okay. Basement it is. Here we go. We're gonna investigate the basement. 156. You cautiously descend the stairs, which stand in the corner as Heather screams at Josh. Yes, that could also be hashtag punk. That is a reference to uh, Blair Witch Project, 
which we watched yesterday night on Mystery Zombie Theater 3000. If you want to watch all of the past episodes of Mystery Zombie Theater 3000, they are up on Discord, you know, so you can watch them and that's going to happen like in Blair Witch Project. When you reach the bottom of the stairs, you know, you find yourself in a dank and dusty basement, illuminated by a single dim and flickering bulb that dangles precariously from the ceiling. The room smells faintly of cigarette smoke. You notice an old table across from you, on which sits a strange collection of items, a pair of cracked clay cylinders, a gemstone studded altar with cur curious scrolls, a stack of papers, and an unnatural looking idol of green sea stone fashioned in the shape of a lizard-like creature. Behind the table is a steam steel and other bootlegging uh, equipment a steel and other bootlegging equipment so you know josh was the guy that killed us the last time here in this basement but now he is unconscious upstairs and down here we have all of the items that were stolen and possibly from us or from the other people you know remember in the last playthrough we actually bought all of these items and they were stolen and then we got taken to this basement and we died, you know? But we kicked just ass, you know? So what do we do? Do we look over the items or do we leave? What do we do now? Things with Josh never go well, says Jason, yes. What do we do? Do we leave or do we look the items? That is the question at this point. Check out the items, items. Leave. Two items, one leave. Three items. Four items. Christmas. Oh my god, JC, stop saying you know after every sentence. Uh, no, you know. Look at the items. Items. Okay. So, do we look over at the items? Go to two. Uh, one leaf? Okay, well, it's okay. So, go to the items. Chris Murphy says, I'm doing it now. I got it from you. That's nice, you know? Okay, so. Happy little square look at the items? Yes. Okay, 210. So, 156, 210. You stand over the a table of cur curious artifacts as you can see we get some of the things these are the the markings and apparently there was uh, you said you, you know this thing this is near Latotep. this is one of the major you know like uh squirrels don't live very long it seems yes this is near Latotep, one of the the major you know great old ones in cthulhu mythos Just a second. Let me see if I can show you. Uh, this is 142. Nyarla to tap. Oh, we don't have... Well, in the mask of Nyarla Tep, you get that, that figure, you know, but over here it's not showing... This thing doesn't have as many... as many, like, uh, pictures as I would like. Hmm. Maybe here? Just a second. Uh, I know this thing has great old ones, independent races. Let me see if we can get like in the in the. Okay. Artifacts and alien devices, monsters, beasts, and alien gods. Two seventy six. This is the keeper's book. Two seventy six. Two eighty-two. 
killing monsters. You see, look at this. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch over to the big JC. You see? Near lots of tap. This guy. Over here you got Mighty Cthulhu. Mighty Cthulhu. And this is Nyar Latotep. That one. And this is Dole. But this is Nyar Latotep. I recognize his ass. There you go. Love the extra lore, yes. This is nerdy things, you know? So, uh, 210. You stand over the table of uh, curious artifacts, confident that they have something to do with the strange events in Esbury. You decide it's best to look them over and glean and glean learn what information you can from them. You begin by uh, leafing through the stack of notes. You realize they contain some of the same characters that are written in some of the ancient items. You may be able to use these notes to assist in any translation attempts you wish to make. There is also an empty sack on the table that was used to bring those relics here. You are free to load them back up and take them with you. After examining each item, it will be added to your inventory and you will be uh, redirected back to this entry or given the option to proceed as appropriate. You should not select any option more than once. When you're ready, feel free to leave. Okay, so we can start taking items if we want, you know? So, what do we do? Uh, I'm gonna start checking, you know, if you want to look over the journal, let's just go to the journal. Because we can take the items, you know? Yes, take the look and run. 240. Looking through the book, you become deeply engrossed and spend the next few hours in study. A few hours just there with the other guy just up there, you know? Professor Harris met several... Uh, the, the time spent yields valuable information. Professor Harris made several trips to India, starting about 12 years ago. During these visits, he went to multiple sites to make observations and recover artifacts. Um, um, his longest and most profitable trip appears to have been 10 years ago during an excursion to Sarnath, India, where he writes about recovering... Recovering? It's not delivery, it's the journal, yes. There's several items uh, from an active Buddhist uh, shrine. Apparently, Professor Harris having the artifacts for uh, couldn't re uh, resist having the artifacts for his personal collection. The description of the items he came across in Sarnath matched some of the items at the estate sale last night. The clay cylinders, the gemstone encrusted altar, and the lizard-like idol are all described in detail in the entries related to this tr his trip to Sarnath. Yes, we gave time Josh uh, to wake up. Yeah. These same items then appear th throughout the rest of the journal. He'd clearly been studying uh, these items over the past decade and uh, developed something of a fixation with them. It was the idol that initially caught Harris's eyes. And according to him, the depiction of the great and grotesque water lizard matched no description of any known Hindu deity. Hoping to find clues to the idol's identity, Harris set about trying to translate the mysterious script on the cylinders and the altar. In doing so, he met with significant difficulty, as the text was only barely recognizable as an archaic dialect of a pre-Sanskrit language. The process was slow and painstaking until about a year ago. Um, at this time, Professor Harris writes of having a strange and enlightening dream. He reports walking in the ancient world from whence these items originated, a grand city of marble walls and onyx streets, of bronze gates and marvelous palaces and gardens. He writes of visiting the 17 tower temples of this ancient city and meeting the bearded gods who dwell there, sat upon their ivory thrones. Harris calls the strange place Sarnath, despite the sheer impossibility of this. He claims that among the temples he learned the secrets of the ancient writing. His next entry goes on to describe the old clay cylinders as the brick cylinders of Cadatheron, though he hadn't yet identified the other objects. The next few pages have been torn from the journal. Yes, it is a very nice city, and I'm going to tell you just, it's a very nice city that was... 
Uh, you can learn this from reading in the the Lovecraft, you know, the the the, the doom that came to Sarnet from Lovecraft. It was an ancient city populated by like water uh, lizard people, that they worshipped this uh, water deity in the in like uh, in the lake, and these these people were kind of squishy, you know, but they were good people. They were peaceful. Uh, but humans nearby were jealous of them and they didn't like that they were like squishy monster like people and one day they went and they killed everybody in that city and the deity these guys like worship came over and just eradicated the humans you know that's pretty much what happened you can read that in the lovecraft tale the doom that came to sarnet um, he, the black cylinders the entry resumes with more mundane uh, matters though there are still references to the artifact from time to time the more recent entries in the journal speak of Harris's daily studies and living with Amelia it's clear that he cares about her deeply from the way he writes about her but he laments that his studies keep him from spending the time with her that he would like instead he lavishes her with gifts and money which he was all too happy to accept he notices that Amelia has never been happy, happier, despite the distance between them. Humans can suck sometimes. Yeah, and th these these guys that lived, they were not human, you know, they were kind of squishy litters, something like that. But they were good people, and the humans went and killed them. And the deity was angered, and they slaughtered the humans. That's the doom that came to Sarnet. The last entry to catch your eye is dated over, uh, a little over a week ago. Apparently, the page is torn from this, his journal when missing only recently. Professor Harris expresses deep concern at this, and the, there were no signs of forced entry to his study, and only he and Amelia had access to it, though he was sure he hadn't removed them from the journal himself. You finish your reading by glossing over the last week of the professor's life, which is rather uneventful and peaceful beyond his continued obsession with the artifacts, and his occasional worries about Amelia. Okay, so we got the journal. Now we're gonna check over the clay cylinders, 218. You turn the hardened clay cylinders over in your hands, your eyes falling on the large cracks running through both items. Despite this damage, their solid construction has led to the cylinder survival through the ages. You know? Um, the next most obvious quality is the strange writing that is plastered along the side of each cylinder. It's quite remarkable that it doesn't resemble any language known to you. Using the notes on the table, you attempt to translate it. We are doing an archaeology role, you know? Archaeology? We got 70. We're going to attempt this. And I'm going to use luck points if we don't, you know, like, do it. 81. I'm going to use 11 lock points. I don't give red says, you know. So, we that puts us at a uh, 50. No, 49. Sorry. Okay, so. Um Oh, no, it's a hard archaeology uh, check. No, I'm not going to use so many points, you know? Uh, or do we do a hard archaeology check? We need to do 35. Ah, oh, screw it. We fail, you know? We fail. We couldn't translate it. 242, you simply have no idea what you're looking at. The characters are strange and unusual, and they match no script known to you. Studying the rest of the object yields no other clues. Yes. What? No? Okay, sorry, 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 sorry. It doesn't set hard? 240? Let me see. We were in 218. Oh, it was not hard. Okay. Okay. 
So I needed to expand 11 lock points and that's it. So I'm just gonna remove the 11 lock points. I'm gonna go to 49 and we're gonna say it succeeded. 204. Okay, good. Nice. 204. You turn the hardened clay cylinders over in your hand and squint to make out the tiny script press into their sides. Consulting the notes stacked be behind you, and this is good because the other one was an ending, you begin to work out a rough translation. The cylinders tell the story of the lake mist green being of Ib, with their bulging eyes, pouting, flabby lips, curious ears, and voiceless mouths. It speaks of the origin of these strange beings, how they descended one night from the moon in a mist, and gave praise to the chiseled sea stone idol of Bokrug, beneath the gibbous moon. These, these people, the green beings from Ib, they were mute, they descended from the moon, they were kind of squishy. These are the guys I told you the humans killed, you know, because they didn't like them. Retribution for making you lose the role earlier, <laughs> thank you. It goes on to describe the strange city of stone and the ritual destruction of precious metals to appease this detectable water lizard, you know? Was it the green mist? Well, maybe. The tale is perplexing and impossible, but if true, it's rather frightening. You recall the green mist outside and note with alarm that the moon is gibbous tonight. A gibbous? As you place the clay cylinders in the sack, you glance over at the sea green idol nearby and are further chilled by what this might pretend. Increase the Cthulhu meters by two percentiles. Okay, Cthulhu meters. Uh, Cthulhu meters. I'm at zero, so I'm increasing to zero two. Interesting. Okay. Go to 210, okay. So, we're in the end game now, people. We look at the journal, at the cylinders, and we need to look at the idol, you know? This is the, the big one, 195. You look the idol over. It's made of a sea green stone and chiseled in the likeness of a water lizard of some sort. The sculptor is grotesque and hideous and the depiction of the lizard-like creature unnerves you. Still, the work is extremely well-preserved pres and unquestionably ancient. You feel uncomfortable staring at the alien-looking thing for too long, so you stow it away in the sack out of sight. 210. We're back at 210. Okay, we got everything, and the last thing is the altar. the altar 230 you examine the extraordinary altar the most readily apparent features beyond its size are the many gemstones set into this surface they are of greenish yellow color and shine even in the half light of the room you also notice strange lettering written in broad strokes along the object's sides the symbols are smeared and sloppily done, suggested they were written with some haste. What you had originally taken for paint is, upon closer examination, dried blood. And you know, it was dried blood from the priest that had taken that thing, and when the, 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 the idol, you know, and when that creature came from the late and attacked the humans, you know, and first it attacked the like the priest that was trying to keep it at bay, and that why that's why the, the 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 priest wrote something with blood on the altar. You know, well you cannot be certain. It would appear that this item has been involved in some tragedy. Using the notes on the table, you might be able to piece together a translation of the text written in blood. Make an archaeology roll. Okay, we're gonna do an archaeology roll. Let's go to the character sheet. It's a standard archaeology roll. So, 70. Dice can. This is a... Holy crap. This is a 100. 
This is what is called an extreme failure. Extreme failure. But luckily, no... No consequences, you know? It's a crit. Yeah, it's a critical failure, you know? And uh, the... Um, the the translation is something like i don't know they came or something like that it's in it's here it's a, it's in it's in this book um the doom that came to Farnet. just a second let me try to find it here The statement of Randolph Carter, the altar, the altar. I think I think it it said something. Maybe it said something like doom. You know. Really need new dice. Ah, well, probably. No, we're not. It, there was no effect. You know. We go to two ten, and in two ten. Hoping for the best, but expecting the worst. So we, the bedroom we already checked. We need to leave. There's no other option. We got all of this thing, the stuff, and now we're going, leaving the house. The house. One eighty one. One eighty one, and we have all items. You decided you've seen enough of Joshua's house and you have no reason to linger here. We're in the game game now, people. This is this is going to the end. So now we need to stay frosty. You exit the building and close the door behind you. You look out into the fog and find it thicker than you remember. You can see almost nothing. Compounding this problem is the darkness, which has completely fallen while you were inside. Armed with new knowledge, you feel prepared to confront what lies ahead of you. You take a few steps out into the street and are shocked to find the town's cobblestone waterlogged. The lake's water level is rising and Esbury is beginning to flow. Given earlier events, you suspect this might not be entirely natural. No, the creature from, you know, the, 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 the idol is coming back to slaughter the humans, you know? And Stephen Tip 5 a 49 things and the awesome stream so far. Thank you, Stephen. Much appreciated. Even if it is, you know, uh, like a uh, uh, natural, the rapidly rising water is a serious threat in itself. You feel a twinge of fear, but overcome it and spur yourself into action. You know, you must escape the flood and then you must ask, uh, act quickly. Jason says, well, we're screwed. Not yet, not yet. If you know where to meet with Banyu, now is the time you may choose to do so. To search for high ground and hope to avoid the rising waters, go to 211. To try to around the rising tide, go to 194. To meet up with Banyu, check the entry number on your, uh, noted on your investigator sheet, then go to it. So what do we do, people? Do we go to high ground? Do we try to run? Or do we go and get the monk, which we know is to in, in, in entry 215? Those are our three choices. Go to higher ground, outrun the tide, and go and get Banyu. I, I want to go get the, the monk, you know, Banyu. Banyu, yes. Yeah, we're going to get Banyu. He's happy, you know. He was happy. He was so happy. We're gonna go and try to get venue, so we go to 215. I think we're gonna get the happy ending. Oh, and by the way, this is this is the bad guy. You see that 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 is the creature that kills everybody. You know, the, 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 the like the 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 deity that the the Eb worship before they got slaughter, slaughtered. 2.15. There we go. Never leave a man behind. Yes, we do not leave a monk behind particularly. 2.15. You rush across the street and into the church. 
all the while splashing it, uh, through the ever rising water. You go like. Sp -sp 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 you slam the door behind you and make your way down the aisle towards the Buddhist monk standing be beside the high altar. As you approach him, you can see that the man looks shaken. His eyes are wide and he ha his hands tremble as he holds on to one of the pews for support. He fixes his gaze upon you and starts speaking quickly in a language you don't understand. He stops himself, then begins speaking frantically. I did not think you would make it back. Are you, are you okay? Did you see what is out there? The monk? No, the monk is just... Some of these items used to be in his uh, monastery in India, and they were dropped by the professor. So that's why this, this guy wants them back. He's, he's, not, he's not a bad guy. You know, he's happy. You know, look at the happy face. You mentioned the rising water, and he shakes his head vigorously. No, the creatures in the mist, the green monsters. You raise a skeptical eyebrow, and he leads you to the door. He cracks the door open slightly, and you gaze out into the mists. You do indeed see something strange, a non-entirely human silhouette shambling about in the darkness and the fog. Jason says, I'm not that trusting. Yeah. They see a non-human silhouette shambling in the mist. Before you get, get a better look, the monk yanks you back into the room and closes the door. But not before the thing notices and a loud banging begins on the door mere seconds later. The, the, the thing is outside and is banging on the door. You see it now, yes? They come for us. He draws you closer, pulling you in so he can speak in a hushed tone, though still in a hurried manner. That is why I came here, friend. My temple wanted me to bring the relics back because they are cursed by evil things. My temple would perform rites over the relics to keep the curse away, but they are not safe elsewhere. It may be too late, but I know the words. Come, join me. We will stop this. He takes your hand and drags you to the altar. You set down the sack of things, and the monk closes his eyes and begins to speak in a strange tongue. Yayar nok nui ab bokrok. He utters each, or actually it could sound something more like this. Yayar nok nui ab bokrok. You know, because of the, the magic. He utters each syllable slowly and carefully, giving you the chance to join with him if you so choose. If you have the strange idol, go to 227. And yes, we have the strange idol because we got all the things. We got all the loots, you know. Take all. R, R. Take all. Go to 227. I'm very proud of all of you people, you know. You performed yourself as a proper Cthulhu investigator and not a happy little squirrel. So enjoy this, which I'm going to read for you because I noticed what it says down here, you know? So enjoy this. <clears throat> 227. You stare at Banyu as he completes his chant and it is as if a great weight has fallen from his shoulders. You look at him curiously for a moment before you've uh, before uh, uh, you for a moment before you notice the pounding at the doors fade to a stop. Cautiously you go to the door and crack it open a little so you can look outside. As the door swings open, a rush of water swells into the church, soaking your legs and the floor around you before pulling amid the church pews. Looking out into the street, it appears that all of Esbury is awash with waist-deep water, though the fog, the fog has faded and the water doesn't appear to be rising any further. Yes, Jason, we've done well this time, yes. Banyu comes to join us, to, con to join you, and he breathes a sign of relief. It is done now. We will be safe for the moment. I will take the artifacts with me when I leave this place. We will prevent this from happening again. With that, 
Banyu gathers up the sacks of items by the altar and wades out into the flood water. You don't know where he's going, but you never see him again. In time, Esbury is evacuated. The bodies of some residents are found, their deaths labeled as drowning. Some residents claim to have seen strange things in the mist, which the papers label as an outbreak of mass hyst hysteria brought on by the anomalous floating. Some residents are committed to mental institutions, though many return to Esbury when the water recedes. You're still not entirely sure what went on there, but you're fully aware that it wasn't entirely natural. You do your best to forget it, but the memory still lingers in the back of your mind. You never return to Esbury. You have survived this adventure, and you may save this character to use at a later time if you wish. Your visit to Esbury is over. The end. We got what I like to call people, just judging by all of this, the good ending, you know? We got the monk to do the chanting, we had the idol, and that we made it out alive. We survived, we stopped the eldritch being that was rising from the lake, which, like I told you, is, let me just show you, is this jackass. This is the, 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 the uh, elder god that rose from the lake. Stephen says, glad I was here for this one. Great ending. Yes, we survived. And now we can go on and uh, like fourth time, actually, Jason, because we actually remember that we played two times the first one and this is the second time. So it was actually four times the charm. And we survive and we can go on to uh, fight the Eldritch Beans one more time in a different uh, adventure. So yeah, this lady over here, she kicked a lot of ass and she saved the town and she helped the, 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 the monk. And, and the monk, he, you, you know, you want to know how, what the monk looks like right now? He looks like this. He looks like this. He's happy. He's happy. So yeah, people. Thank you. Oh, yeah, I have slept since then. Yeah. Look forward to another one. My first time catching a role-playing adventure. Really enjoyed it. Thank you, friendly boys. Thank you, living life. Thank you, everybody. Congratulations. We made the good choices. And now, because of that, this guy, you know, over there, he's happy. He's smiling like that because evil has been contained and the tragedy has been averted and we survived so yeah this was a long session two hours and 37 minutes the chilling bike yeah we survived so have a good one and i hope you enjoy this and tomorrow full resident evil end of zoe episode so you can have something to watch but thank you very much for joining me with this call of cthulhu solo rpg adventure alone against the tide We made this bunk happy, and this lady over here, she kicked a lot of ass. So I hope you have a good night, and uh, I'll see you next time. Bye.